Mind Games, Part 1. As narcissists, we are designed to conquer. Those of us that are aware, enjoy the conquering. We are aware of what we are doing. Nowhere is off-limits to our kind as a consequence of our sense of entitlement and lack of boundary, recognition, and your mind is no exception to that prevailing mentality of the narcissist. The repeated application of mind games and the impact that this has on you are something which live long in the memory of those who have experienced them as a consequence of their entanglement with the narcissist. The games are always being played. I doubt that few of you would disagree with that statement. You ought to be aware, however, that the deployment of these mind games which are used against you and is always a factor within any narcissistic dynamic that you have, whether romantic, familial, social, work or otherwise, is not as deliberate as you might first imagine. In the case of lesser narcissists, they will engage in mind games. They have a narrower manipulative palette. They don't have as many manipulations available as mid-range, greater and ultra-narcissists. However, they will still use mind games. They tend to be more rudimentary and basic in nature. And alongside them, those types of narcissists prefer to utilise brutal uh, physical manipulation, physical violence, sexual violence, destruction of property, for instance. With the lesser narcissist, the mind games are actually a collateral to their need to seek the prime aims. The narcissism instinctively imposes them to achieve control over you, either by a direct assertion or, more usually, by nullifying the perceived threat that you pose to the narcissist's control. The lesser narcissist's use of mind games arises out of instinctive behaviours. Lower lesser and middle lesser are not clever, and therefore they lack the cognitive function to engage in purposeful mental torment. The torment that they occasion is a side effect of the way that they behave. With upper lesser A and B, they similarly may not be of a particularly high cognitive function, but sometimes they are. Even then, however, they are not aware that they are manipulative, and therefore there is no premeditation involved in the application of their mind games. There's are similarly instinctive. With regard to the mid-range narcissist, lower mid-range, middle middle range A, B and upper mid-range, the application of them may well appear deliberate to the victim. This is because invariably mid-rangers are of moderate to very high cognitive function. This causes a victim, understandably but mistakenly, to believe that the narcissist knows what he is doing. It is an incorrect belief that the methodologies utilised are predetermined. Just like the lesser, they are instinctive, albeit the mind games will be of a wider application and, because you're dealing with mid-range, will have increased with regard to plausibility compared to that of the lesser. That doesn't mean that they are necessarily entirely plausible, but are of increased plausibility. With the greater narcissist and ultra, this is where the true twisted behaviour manifests. Because not only are the mind games a consequence of the necessity of seeking out the prime aims, we also purposefully engage in them because we know how effective they are at achieving what we want, we are excellent at deploying them, and we positively find it entertaining to 
manipulate this way. The greater and the ultra revel in seeing the application of these particular manipulations, the impact and effect upon you. We enjoy the misery that they cause. We relish the confusion that occurs because we know that we are deliberately doing it, although, of course, we will always deny as such, and we operate with a very high level of plausibility. Mind games operate through the imposition of bewilderment on what is invariably a tired or indeed shattered and exhausted mind. Mind games possess a deafness of touch which is far superior to the brutish application of a fist to a cheek. The configuring of confusion from the use of words alone is a highlight of the greater and ultra's manipulative repertoire. Accordingly, the mind games which arise from your entanglement with a lesser or a mid-range narcissist arise because of the defence mechanisms which are instinctively deployed. Whereas the greater or the ultra, of course this is still linked to that defence mechanism, but it is also consciously regarded by them and as, as an essential part of the narcissistic dynamic. We see it as a noble, important and a hallmark of the sophistication of our level of abuse. These mind games are varied and effective. Their effectiveness, of course, lies in the ability to deny that what we're doing is messing with your mind. And, of course, memory is treacherous. Indeed, in the course of a, few in the course of a short few minutes, you will have read something and only digested actually half of what you have read because of the fallibility of memory. We exploit that. Lesser and mid-range do so instinctively, greater and ultra do so consciously. The fact that you are being worn down, particularly if you are the intimate partner primary source caught in a sustained devaluation, results in our ability to use that to our advantage. Mind games don't leave an evidential trace. And that is why, when you start to suspect what you're dealing with, of course you ought to apply GOSO, but you also ought to record, either by video if possible, audio, or making a note in a journal, or sending an email to yourself, of what has happened. Not only are you building up a useful evidential record should it prove necessary to utilize that in a formal way, i.e. court, you are also creating a touchstone for yourself to preserve your sanity. You will be fully familiar with the dizzying reality being warped and shredded where you start to question yourself. The application of mind games naturally enables us to control you, nullifying any threats to our control that you pose, allow us to draw fuel. It enables us to keep you in situ, to have you believing that you're the problem, causing you to apologise, to try harder, to improve, all of which satisfies our needs. The mind games varied and effective. Anybody who's been on the receiving end of them will testify as to the horrible impact that they have in creating doubt, fear, worry, anxiety, submission and a sense of helpfulness. What are some of these mind games? I'll provide you with a brief overview of a number of them and they will be addressed in further work in detail. Number one, second guessing. The act of making you forget about your own needs because you are conditioned to think about our needs first in order to avoid some dreadful repercussion if you don't. You apply your mind over and over to assessing the situation in the dynamic with us and trying to gauge how you ought to respond, what you should do next, what you should organise, how you should look, how you should behave in order to avoid causing an eruption from us. This second-guessing is integral in the narcissistic dynamic 
and proves very draining. Of course, this second guessing is occasioned by the fact that you don't realise that you're dealing with the narcissistic perspective. You continue to think that you're dealing with a person who sees the world in the same way as you. And when you realise that you don't, and that you see the world differently from us, and you begin to understand what that perspective looks like, as I repeatedly explain, you don't have to like it, but you must understand it, then you will start to second guess less. But until you realise that, you spend so much time involved in this mind game, which is a collateral consequence of the way that we behave. Two, preoccupation. By making ourselves so central to your existence, and, as far as we possibly can, the only thing which matters to you, causes you to find that you're always wondering about us. What are we doing right now? Who are we with? What are we doing? This doesn't necessarily occur just in devaluation. As your addiction to the narcissist is seized upon during seduction, your mind becomes focused on us more and more, driven by your addiction and the emotional thinking. This repeated layering of behaviours affects the plasticity of your mind so that you create neural pathways that mean that your thoughts, when they manifest, invariably go straight to us. This then results in you forgetting about your own needs and focusing on us. And that is precisely what we want. 3. Mirroring We convince you that you are falling in love with the most wonderful and fantastic person that you have ever met. This is achieved by mirroring what you want. In effect, mirroring you. By apparently meeting this need on so many different fronts, you are then drawn into your genuine love for an illusion. You end up falling in love with yourself. And that is why it is so powerful and so hurtful when that mirror shatters. 4. Obsessing. By engaging in the vague, the vapid and the amorphous, we will have you start obsessing over us. Once again, the focus moves on to us as you ask yourself, what did he mean by that comment? Why is he late? Why did he just do that? You then start obsessing and looking for clues, trying to unravel the meaning of a particular facial expression or comment, whereas once you would never have noticed. And invariably, should you then ask other people about what something meant, they are at a loss to provide you with an explanation, and if you will go so far as to ask us, you will invariably met, be met with, you're reading too much into this. 5. Gaslighting. The infamous act of causing you to doubt your own reality, and is invariably the cumulative effect of many different types of mind game. You end up doubting yourself and accepting our false reality as the true reality instead. I will be going into this in considerable detail by providing you with worked examples so you understand how this comes about and how to deal with it. 6. Jettison. The act of having you think that you are about to be disengaged from. Comments will be made which suggest that we are dissatisfied with you, that we are tired of you, and that we have interests elsewhere. Nothing is set out right. There is no guillotine moment. There is nothing concrete. But you are kept living on the edge. Anxious, waiting, wondering. Because the signs are there, aren't they, that you are about to be disengaged from? 7. Jealousy. But she's just a friend. How can I be having an affair when we only meet during daylight? You are reading too much into it. The appearance of somebody who we talk about a lot, spend time with and appear to admire, is designed to cause you to be jealous of us and undermine your self-confidence. 8. Mea culpa. The complexity and absurdity of our behaviour means that you are unable to fathom out what is actually going on. This results in you needing to find some kind of answer in order to give you peace of mind. And therefore, since you have no grounds to question us, because you don't know what you're dealing with, you erroneously decide that you must be the one that is at fault, and you end up blaming yourself. After all, you reason, nobody loses their temper for no obvious reason, do they? Therefore, you must have done something wrong to provoke us. Therefore, it is your fault. Now, empaths repeatedly self-flagellate in this regard. 
9. Projection. The movement of our faults and unpleasant behaviours from us to you. The accusation that you engage in the very behaviour that we undertake ourselves. This is caused because the lesser and mid-range narcissist actually believes that you're the protagonist and the film, if you will, is edited so that the lesser or mid-range behaviour is edited out so it seems like you start the problem. And therefore, in the mind of those narcissists, you are actually seen as the one that is difficult and therefore you are accused of the relevant behaviour. You're always shouting at me. No, you're actually shouting as a response to the narcissist shouting at you, but the narcissist part in that exchange has been edited out by the narcissism. The projection of the greater or the ultra is done knowingly. 10. Character assassination. The unmerited and savage attack on you, criticising you for any number of things. How you walk, how you talk, your hair colour, who your friends are, how you made the coffee this morning. Anything and everything about you will be attacked, even though you can't see any basis for us doing so, and again leads to you repeatedly questioning yourself. 11. Blame shifting. The defensive step to ensure that any threat to control that you manifest is nullified, and so that we are never to blame or to be held accountable. Anything that goes wrong, any incorrect behaviour, any mishap is all down to you. You caused it, you brought it about, you made it happen. Even though you cannot see any factual basis for the accusation that has been flung your way, you end up questioning yourself once again. And we repeatedly blame shift, because no culpability can ever rest with us. 12. Authoritative denial. We don't just deny, which is the first line of the twin lines of the narcissistic defence, we deny with such conviction, determination and authority that surely only someone who is able to do this must be right, yes? Lesser and mid-range deny with authority because they believe their lies, because the narcissism rewrites history. Greater and ultra know that we're lying, but we do it with such conviction and, of course, hidden delight that it comes across in such an authoritative way. We don't self-reflect. You do. You analyse your behaviour and query, perhaps I am at fault. You think in shades of grey. We think in black or white. We are never at fault. We didn't do it. It's your, You're the problem. 13. Gaseous smear campaigns. You are being spoken about, whispered about, and slurs cast against your name. At least, you think that's the case. You seem to be receiving strange glances and hear snickering when you walk by certain people. But again, you never hear anything entirely concrete or certain. Perhaps you're mishearing. You might be misreading the situation. And, of course, we will confirm to you that you are. Maybe it is just paranoia. With those very subtle smears, it is like trying to catch a gas with your bare hands. 14. Silent treatment. A mainstay of narcissistic behaviours, particularly with mid-range narcissists, causing you to ask, why is he silent? Why is he vanished? Why is he not answering my message? What have I done wrong? Will he speak to me again? Why is he ignoring me? What has caused this? Question after question arising out of the simple imposition of not talking to you, walking away from you, not replying to your phone calls or text messages. 15. Double standards. We are so pleasant and wonderful to everybody else. People speak so highly of us. Yet, when the front door is closed, out comes the monster with you. Is it real? Perhaps you are the problem. Or are you taking it out of context and exaggerating? And maybe you are causing this to happen and nobody else does. 16. Amnesia. Linked to denial. We deny having ever done something or said something even though you are positive. Well, fairly certain. At least reasonably sure, or perhaps not, that we did say it. Of course, this works both ways, as we accuse you of having a faulty memory. As we will tell you, we told you last week we would be going out tonight, and why can't you remember these things? Are you doing it in order to annoy us? There's something wrong with your memory. You're losing it. 17. Losing your mind. A simple, blunt mind game. We label you as crazy, unhinged, 
Doolally, Batshit Crazy, Fruit Loop, a maniac who is in need of help. Good Lord, everybody thinks that of you, you know, and they believe that we are a saint for putting up with your behaviour for so long. You're crazy. We tell you this often, arrange for you to get help, see a doctor or a therapist and accompany you to explain to them that you are losing your marbles. Are we making all of this up in order to disturb you further? Or then again, might you just be losing your mind after everything that's been done to you? I'm H.G. Tudor. Thank you for listening.